Through the Gathering Storm produces vital web TV programming designed to help viewers to understand and cope with world conditions and politics that are worsening day by day. Hello, I'm R.T. Byram. The seven Jewish feasts commanded by God are still observed by Jews to this day. What was their purpose, and does that purpose have meaning for all of mankind today? Well, joining me to answer that vital question is Reinhold Buxbaum, who is pastor of the Church of the Way here in Sebring, Florida. Our guest, by the way, is also host of a long-running web TV series entitled Connect the Dots. His web and personal appearances show Israel's key importance to the fulfillment of biblical prophecy leading to the end times and the return of Jesus Christ. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you, R.T. It's always a joy to be with you. Good. Well, I'm sure that most people, uh, Christians and Jews alike, have heard the names of some of the Jewish feasts like uh, Pentecost, uh, Yom Kippur, and even Rosh Hashanah. On the other hand, few Christians and even some Jews fully understand the symbolism and the meaning of all seven of these annually observed feasts. So would you take us through each one of them in turn and help us to understand their importance to us and how they relate to the New Testament church and the end times? I'd be glad to. Uh, why is it, RT, that so few Christians see the connection between the Jewish feasts and our faith in Jesus? Uh, we have to go way back to the second century, and a very unfortunate development happened at that time within the Christian church. Uh, little by little, Christians pulled away from the Jews as Christians developed their own customs and their own traditions. In fact, the Jews were called Christ killers and were eventually avoided altogether by Christians. In the year 325 A.D., the Roman Emperor Constantine wrote a letter to Christian leaders. Constantine supported the separation of the date of Easter from the Jewish Passover with the following explanation, quote, It appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul, let us then have nothing in common with them, detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way." End of quote. But it didn't stop there. We go down the timeline, we come to Martin Luther, and Martin Luther, Luther is known as the father of the Reformation, yet he too hated the Jews. Amazing. In 1543, Martin Luther wrote a book called The Jews and Their Lies. Here are some of the remarks about them. Quote, Houses owned by Jews are to be raised and the owners made to live in agricultural outbuildings. Their religious writings are to be taken away. Rabbis are to be forbidden to preach and to be executed if they do. Imagine that. Oh. Safe conduct on the roads which are to be abolished for Jews, and silver and gold is to be removed and put aside for safekeeping. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Jewish population is to be put to work as agricultural slave laborers. Jewish synagogues and schools are to be burned to the ground, and the remnants buried out of sight." End of quote. Mm. For almost 2,000 years, Christians wanted nothing to do with the Jews or their, their Jewish feasts. It wasn't until a new wave called Evangelicals came on, a on the scene and the true connection between Old and New Testament, the Jews and the Christians were reestablished. Now, I want to be clear about the fact that Jews without Christ are just as much lost as Gentiles without Christ. Religiosity has never and will never get anyone into heaven. It has to be a personal relationship between Jesus and our Savior and the individual who comes with a repentant heart to ask for the gift of salvation. Yes. So, with this out of the way, let's ask the question, what do the Jewish feasts have to do with us Christians? And so here's the answer. 
every one of the seven feasts is a foreshadowing of a New Testament fulfillment. In other words, God gave the Jews several appointed times, that's the meaning of feasts, throughout the year for specific reasons and every one of them has a New Testament fulfillment. And here is where it gets really interesting because four out of the seven called the spring feasts have already been fulfilled. But the fulfillment of the fall feasts, that's numbers five, six, and seven, is yet in the future. So, what does that mean for us? Let's go ahead and go through the seven feasts or appointed times in a nutshell. Okay, well I know personally that the first feast is called Passover, so named after the time that the death angel passed over the homes that had the doorposts splashed with the blood of a lamb. But that, as you say, was a foreshadowing of a later event. Yes. Uh, in fact, if you listen to Leviticus 23, verse 4 and 5. Let's turn to that. And I quote. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. End of quote. The New Testament fulfillment is found in Matthew 26 and 27. Let me read those verses to you. Quote, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Jesus truly was the lamb that was sacrificed for the sins of the world. So, at the moment of fulfillment, then Jesus shed his blood for all of mankind and took the place of the Lamb's blood that had been put over the doorpost that spared those within from immediate death. That's right. So we know the second feast, number two, is called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is an unusual name. And it is unusual. It's probably a very mysterious symbol for many people. Explain that to us. All right. Let's look up uh, the verse, Leviticus 23, verse 6, where God instituted that second feast. And I quote, On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. End of quote. Just one day after the feast of Passover is the feast of unleavened bread. Traditional Jewish homes will take some bread with yeast and throw the crumbs down in corners of their home and then they'll sweep it up and throw it out. The yeast is a symbol of sin. Mm -hmm. Yeast will affect the whole dough just as sin affects the whole person and both bring about decay. Where there is no yeast, there is no decay. Now. For the New Testament fulfillment, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. And I quote, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Do you see the comparison to sin and the decay in our lives? Very clearly. Uh, Jesus, a man without sin, following immediately after his death, laid in the tomb for three days without decay. How amazing it is that God puts such deep symbolism in a common food, bread. We all eat that. That's the right. analogy of sin and leaven is made so much clearer that a multitude of words could not explain it. Now, 
That brings us to the third feast, the Feast of the First Fruits, another example of God's use of familiar things to represent the deep meaning that he has. Okay, for the third feast, let's turn back again to Leviticus 23, and this time verse 9 and 10, where God commands the first fruits and as an offering. Quote, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. End of quote. This feast of the Israelites is celebrated right after the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Israel will bring the first fruit of the harvest to the temple as an offering, celebrating new harvest, new life. The New Testament fulfillment of this text is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. And okay. I quote, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. End of quote. Christ's resurrection from the dead as the first one in his resurrection body is called the first fruits of those who have died. The very first one who rose in a resurrection body was Jesus Christ. Prelimination to when we become the next ones after the first fruits. That's right. So you've covered three of the spring feasts now and you've gone into their fulfillment. Now tell us about the fourth of the spring feasts called the Feast of Weeks or as most of us know it, Pentecost. That's right. Exactly 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, the Israelites were to bring two loaves of bread to the priest. Pentecost means count, count 50. 50. We're still in Leviticus 23, and we're looking at verse 15, and I quote, From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the weave offering, count off seven full weeks, end of quote. In the New Testament, it was exact to the exact day of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the beginning of the church, the New Testament church. Now, listen to the amazing thing that happened on that day as recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And I quote, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. End of quote. Now, please stay with me. Okay. Each one of the first four spring feasts had a precise New Testament significance of what God did. Jesus died, Jesus laid in a tomb for three days, Jesus rose again, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and the church was born. So here's the question for us. If the first four feasts of the Old Testament had such a precise fulfillment in the New Testament, don't you think the last three Jewish feasts also have New Testament significance? I would. I mentioned that the first four feasts are called the spring festivals or feasts and all at, uh, are appointed at times by God. Now the last three are called the fall festivals. The first four are close together in the spring, the last three are close together in the fall. So let me ask you again, on God's timetable, what would be the very next move of God. Which feast is next? Which appointed time is on God's timetable? Well, let me see. The first four feasts that have been fulfilled in the spring, which signifies to me the beginning of God's plan for mankind. So the next feast celebrated in the fall must have to do with the completion of the plan. So tell us about now the fifth feast. Good. Feast number five. It is called Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Trumpets. Listen again as we find it described in Leviticus 23, verse 23 through 25. 
And I quote, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blast. Do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. End of quote. Is there a New Testament significance? Let me give you a hint. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. Quote, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. End of quote. And also, now let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. And I quote, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. What a glorious promise. Amen. When will this take place? Well, at the last trump. We call it rapture from the Latin vulgate, the word rapi or rapio, rap, rap, yeah. uh, from which the English word rapture is formed. It means to seize or to snatch or to, to tear away. It's also translated as caught up in the King James Version. This is so important, so please listen. There's nothing else that has to be biblically happening before the Lord comes back for His own children, who will then have a new incorruptible body. Death and sickness and pain will be conquered for those who have sought and found salvation. You know, every day in September till the beginning of October, depending on the new moon, I, I have a heightened sense of the return of the Lord. And I'm saying to myself, well, maybe this year. You know, there's a Jewish saying that says, next year in Jerusalem. Hmm. Uh, for almost 2,000 years, the Jews were saying, next year in Jerusalem. You see... They were hoping that maybe next year is the year when they can be back in their beloved city of Jerusalem. And then it happened. When? It was in June of 1967. It, Jerusalem was taken back by the Jews and every Jew's dream came true. Next year in Jerusalem had arrived. That's what many Christians think about the rapture. Maybe this year. One year, it will actually happen, and the rapture will take us all away. What an unbelievable experience that will be. Yeah. The mind boggles at the thought of leaving the earth and meeting Jesus the Christ in the clouds and to be with Him forever. Now, Pastor Buxbaum, tell us about the sixth feast, Yom Kippur, also many of us know it as the Day of Atonement. That's right. On the month of Tishri, on the 10th day, the Jews celebrate the Day of Atonement. It is still a very somber and awesome day. It was on that day that all the Jews came to Jerusalem when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies in the temple to pour the Lamb's blood over the Ark of the Covenant for the forgiveness of all the sins of the entire past year of the Israelites. The command God gave the Jews for observing this sacred feast is found in Numbers chapter 29, verse 7 through 11. And I quote, 
On the tenth day of this seventh month, hold a sacred assembly. You must deny yourselves and do no work. Pre present, present as an aroma pleasing to the Lord a burnt offering of one young bull, one ram, and seven male lambs, a year old without defect. With the bull offer, a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah, of the finest flour mixed with oil, with the ram two tenths, and with each of the seven lambs one tenth. Include one male goat as a sin offering. In addition to the sin offering for atonement and the regular burnt offering with its grain offering and their drink offering. End of quote. You know, the Israelites had very exact instructions yes, as to how they were to bring their offerings to the temple. The same was true for the high priest. He had to uh, had every detailed instruction that uh, he had to follow to the T. It was also the day when the scapegoat was released into the wilderness. Uh, this goat carried symbolically the sins of the people into the wilderness, and there the scapegoat died. Mm. Now, Daniel, the prophet, tells us what will happen in the final time period. He describes to us when the Jews will rebuild the temple, but instead of the Messiah, it will be the Antichrist who will sit on the throne in the temple. The persecution of the Jews in those future days will be more severe than ever before, but then Christ appears, and then the future fulfillment of the Day of Atonement has come. Let's open the book of Zechariah and begin in chapter 12, verse 10, and see what happens. And I quote, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inheritance of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son." End of quote. Weeping and grieving. Why? At last they will know the truth. Then an incredible thing will happen to the Jews who have denied Jesus as the Messiah for 2,000 years. In Zechariah 13 verse 1, it tells us what will take place, and I quote, On that day the fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. End of quote. The Messiah will cleanse the Jews from their sins. After that, the Messiah will defend his people from enemies marching against Jerusalem. That's found in Zechariah 14, verse 3 and 4, and I quote, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. End of quote. The end of Armageddon. Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, and who is right behind him? It says all the holy ones. And that is? That's a fulfillment of a New Testament of the Day of Atonement that Paul describes uh, at, in uh, Romans 11, verse 26 and 27. So let me quote. All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion, that's Jerusalem. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, that's Israel. And this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. End of quote. You know, we can only imagine what it will be like when the scales fall away from the eyes of the Jews and they finally see that Jesus has always been their long-awaited Messiah. That's what a right. rejoicing time that will be once the grieving has passed. Now, let's look at the final feast, yeah. the seventh, and perhaps the most joyful event in the history of mankind, of course, that is the Feast of Tabernacles. That's correct. The Feast of Tabernacles. Let me share with you what that is all about. It's the most joyful of all the feasts. It's also known as Sukkoth, or the Feast of Booths. We find this in Leviticus chapter 23, 
which describes what was and still is to take place during the seven day feast. And I quote, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacles begins. And it lasts for seven days, live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native born Israelites are to live in such shelters so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt." End of quote. This is why it is also called the Feast of the Booths. Even today, all Israelites will build some booths and live in it for seven days. Why? To remind them when God led the Israelites through the wilderness. God was represented in a tabernacle which was a tent and the people lived in booths. Now here is the important thing. God will once again live among us people. God will tabernacle among us again. Let me show you this truth in Revelation 21 verse 3 and I quote, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. End of quote. One day, we will enjoy the literal presence of Jesus and God among us, the eternal fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacle. I trust that the understanding of the seven feasts with their New Testament fulfillment will make us more informed and sensitive to God's program for the future and to His imminent return, the snatching up of Christians, which we call the rapture of the Lord. You know, uh, Pastor Buxbaum, the God's way is so far beyond anything that man could plan, and yet He has lovingly let us look over his shoulder through these seven incredible feasts. He knows the end from the beginning and shares it with all who seek the salvation through Jesus Christ. He's worthy of all praise. Our gracious thanks to Pastor Reinhold Buxbaum for this vital and timely message. Would you please close this message with, with a prayer, Pastor? I would love to do that. Let's pray. Lord, we would just want to thank you for your precious word. We want to thank you for both the Old and New Testament and how we see the feasts of the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New Testament. And how exciting it is that now we are waiting for the fulfillment of the last three feasts with the rapture coming next, the snatching up of the believers. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful truth. Oh, Lord, let us be ready. Let us be waiting for you. Let us look forward to your coming because what a joyous event that will be. Until then, Lord, we pray that you'll find us faithful as we work here for your honor and your glory. That's our desire in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the end time clock is approaching the midnight hour. So I'm asking you, are you prepared for the return of Jesus Christ in power as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Now, don't miss a single message here on ThroughTheGatheringStorm.com as we bring the truth of the living word to a dying world searching for answers. Until the next time, I'm Chaplain R.T. Byram.